um, w watching what they did in the civil rights movement, and I, I was living in the North uh, as a kid, but we talked about it a lot when I was in junior high school and in high school because these were innocent, vulnerable victims. These were kids, and then especially, uh, I mean, the most gruesome and and uh, ghastly occasion was the the bombing of the church in Birmingham, killing the little girls. And it, it, there's even research now that says you kill little girls and everybody's going to hate you. Everybody's going to figure out how to rise up against you. And and so there was a feeling, a great feeling in the north um, and in the far west, uh, pretty much the whole country except for the, uh, the old Confederacy, where Jim Crow was, you know, legal. Uh, that. That's not our America. You don't get to do that in this country. In fact, we even had a civil war about this. You don't get to do that anymore. And so I had friends who were older than I was, who by 1964 were going down volunteering at Freedom Summer, etc. And it, it was outrageous uh, to the whole country because we were still uh, sort of in this uh, afterglow of World War II where we saw ourselves as the beacon of uh, democracy, the beacon of equality and human rights on planet Earth. I mean, we really irrigated that self-image. And this flew flat, smack in the face of that. So when they were doing sit-ins, it was radicalizing people who they didn't even know that they were radicalizing. And it really helped to prepare a lot of us for doing, ultimately, nonviolent resistance to other things. It's kind of one of the lessons of nonviolence is that there's a lot of talk about, well, you can't be wed to the consequences, you just have to do the right thing. But oftentimes we are very strategic even when we don't know it. And we're very strategic to other peoples in other struggles because all of us who are acting, as uh, James Lawson pointed out last night, we are setting up examples for other people to draw from. I had, I had done my first plowshare action back in 1985, which a plowshare action is basically you go out and you do what we call direct disarmament. In other words, if the governments won't do it, I'm going to do it with my bare hands or simple tools if I have to. And then the other, one of the other elements of that is that you are personally accountable for what you do. So the first one I went out and I dismantled a part of this antenna and then took it, uh, which, which was a command facility for thermonuclear submarines. Then I took that into, I actually cut it up into pieces and took a piece into the local congressman, put it on the desk and said, you know, tell Bob Davis hi from me and I've taken down part of that system. And I said, but you don't need to call the sheriff because they're only a block away and that's where I'm going next with my other, my other little piece of this. So I did that in, in 1985 and, and that was, um, that really was for me a change in direction. I had been much more involved in what I consider to be the Martin Luther King model of mass action. And the plowshare was much more the individual model of, of the Phil Berrigan type uh, go out there as a witness. During that same period of time, uh, Native American treaty rights were in question in northern Wisconsin, uh, in the northeastern uh, part of Minnesota and in the upper peninsula of Michigan. And as we allied ourselves with the tribes um, and began to do uh, trainings on our campuses and in our communities for going out simply to be witnesses when they practiced their treaty rights, uh, then we were, we were elevating the skills of nonviolence in a regional sense because we did a lot of these trainings. We had been fighting this thermonuclear command facility for decades since it was first announced it was going to be built in Wisconsin. And we never got it unbuilt until the tribes uh, jumped in with us. As soon as our organizing inadvertently built coalition, we didn't say there's a quid pro quo. We didn't go to the tribe and say, if we support you in this, will you support us in that? We just offered ourselves because it was the right thing to do. It was so clearly the right thing to do. And the racism was not subtle, to put it that way. So we got involved for many years in doing that, uh, really involved in spreading the skills out because so many people were so interested in this and relatively few people from the little local area were interested in stopping this thermonuclear command center. So we didn't know it, but at the time our various skilling uh, and competency building exercises uh, were preparing the way to really radically change the structure and the conditions.
one thing that I stressed a lot with them was this action, reflection, action model because so much activism is just action, action, action. And somebody, you know, tries a little reflection and everybody's like, action, action, action. We've got to get out there. Time for words is over. You know. Talk is cheap. Walk the walk. Don't just, you know. But you have to slow down after every one. The, the thing that I asked these students at Northland to do was get involved in the strategic planning, do the action, don't go get arrested, and most of them didn't. You know, occasionally there would be one who would commit a crime of passion that day. Uh, but then, within a day, maybe two days at the outset, we meet, and my role was just to be the scribe on the blackboard. What worked, what didn't work. And then the advance in knowledge happens, and only then. Because then they're folding their experience into the theory that we've been talking about in the classroom, and they're producing a synthesis and an evaluation that's telling them something that's going to stick. You know, their experience means something now because now, oh, ah, next time we'll do this. You know, and it's the human problem solving gene, whatever that is. We're all born with it, but unless you activate it with people, and do it in a, in a basis where it's elicitive. So you're getting something from everybody. Everybody can contribute. And then you come out with a collective, collaborative learning at the end. You don't have one sage who is a, you know, the strategic master who's saying, you know, thank you, young grasshoppers. Here's what we learned. That's not the way it works. Uh, if all you do is worry about the competency and the and uh, wiping away the dictator, then you're doing the, the most superficial thing that you can do. It's for a very good reason, and you're achieving a very good thing. But that the difference between reform and revolution really is that revolution never ends. If you don't uh, continue to uh, engage in basically a national conversation about what's next, you know, what's the next good thing we can do, rather than just say, well got that all done you know uh, now we're now we're on to living happily ever after the big machinery of organizing this necessary to build a civil uh, resistance campaign uh, you've got to keep it humming along somehow and that I think is the biggest challenge because if there's no ongoing process of reflection and how do we evolve from here then we we kind of stall out and guess what you know the bad actors are raring to go they're at the margins they've got a plan on the shelf it's kind of a good combination of East and West because I think the philosophies of the East are much more centered on change is permanent. That's the only permanent is change. And so you can't just, there's nothing that's decided once and for all. Nothing.